Thank you. Can we have the CV slide of Dr. Ranjana Khanna, ma'am? She's already participated very actively in the program <laughs> so far, but we have not formally introduced her. Dr. Ranjana Khanna was the Vice President of Proxy in 2017. She is the Founder President of the Prayagraj Chapter of ISOPAP. She is, of course, currently a Governing Council Member of the ICOG. Along with me, she was a President of the Allahabad Society 2013-16. Also served the same society in various other positions, including Honorary Secretary, Treasurer. She has organized so many conferences in Allahabad, both during her tenure as Vice President before and after that period as well. She's won several awards, including the Foxy Vira Award in 2022. For the Allahabad Society, she has won the VK Tank Reproductive Healthcare Promotion Trophy in 2015, the Smriti Mailan Award in EICOG 2013, and several other felicitations awards to her credit. We are also delighted to welcome Dr. Parag Biniwale, sir, the Vice President, the Vice Chair of ICOG, so was held up in an emergency and therefore joined late. And I hand over now to Dr. Ranjana Kannanan to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Parag Biniwale. Uh, he is a senior consultant, OBGY Pune. First of all, he's vice president of uh, ICOG, vice chair of ICOG, unit head and PG teacher Kamla Nehru Hospital, secretary ICOG, he was in uh, 2018 to 2020, president of the Menopause Society Pune, national joint secretary IMS, national website editor Foxy, peer reviewer journal of OBGYN, chairman young talent promotions Committee uh, 2008 you, to 10. That's enough. That's enough. That's Don't enough. waste time in that. I, I think everybody <laughs> knows you uh, very no, well. No, no, no. And we are looking forward to hearing from you on preterm labor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ranjana, for those kind words. Uh, I bring greetings from ICOG, and it's indeed a pleasure to be part of this program. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, the office bearers of AMOGS and particularly Dr. Pratik Tambe who heads the endocrinology committee of IMOX for considering me for today's presentation. And thank you, Harish Bhai, for uh, change, allowing me to change the sequence as I was, I was uh, held up in an emergency. And, yes, sir. Uh, Please, yes. Uh, it's, it's very heartwarming to see the three of you because you are my governing council members in the ICOG. And of course, uh, Dr. Meg uh, is the past chairperson of ICOG. Uh, in next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about one problem which really bothers all of us and it keeps on bothering us uh, because let's not forget that we are the most populous country in the world now. And then we are going to face the problems of preterm labor and then we have to be really well equipped to manage uh, preterm labor and preterm birth. All of us know that delivery, any delivery that takes place before 37 weeks of the gestational age is labeled as preterm birth, but it is estimated that one in 10 babies are born too soon. Uh, it, it is also estimated that 15 million births take place much earlier than the expected date of delivery and 1 million plus babies die because of the consequences of prematurity. And of course, we are one of the most important contributors to prematurity and preterm births. Well, we are aware about the mortality aspect, but let's not forget the morbidity that is also associated with prematurity. Dr. Haresh has very uh, uh, nicely talked about one small intervention which can help save life of a patient. And of course, uh, we do get a better neurological output, but respiratory distress syndrome, necrotizing enterocolitis and sepsis apart from intraventricular hemorrhage are the reasons why these babies suffer and even die. So when we talk about preterm labor, we should be well versed with the factors which are associated with preterm labor. Traditionally, we know that overdistended uterus is likely to be a reason uh, for preterm labors and multiple pregnancy contributes to it. Uh, for, of course, we know that 
fertility treatments are the ones which are responsible many a times for multiple births. Previous history of preterm birth is something which is extremely important and this is a deciding factor when we think of managing any patient in preterm labor. Maternal stress, previous pitrimester uh, miscarriages, PPROM, infections, smoking, etc. do contribute to preterm labor to a certain extent. So these are the risk factors which we must keep in mind. So taking good clinical history is of great importance. Short cervix is something which we have to be vigilant about and the presence of any risk factors that can that can be considered as a trigger for screening of cervical length by a transvaginal ultrasound scan. So whenever any pregnant patient, say in the seventh or eighth month, comes to us with symptoms like menstrual-like cramping, mild irregular contractions, low backache, or even pressure sensation in vagina or vaginal discharge, please don't ignore it because we may be dealing with a woman who is in preterm birth and we may lose an opportunity to arrest the preterm birth in order to have a better outcome. Initial evaluation is extremely important. So we must estimate the correct gestational age, look at her reports, find out the exact gestational period and then start intervening. The next question is, has the labor begun or is it imminent? Because this will definitely guide us as to how aggressively we need to manage this particular patient. Is early intervention indicated? So here we must rule out uh, maternal issues like medical disorders or chorioamnionitis, or if the fetus has issues like abruption, infection, abnormal CTGs or even cord prolapse. And of course, fetal presentation is extremely important because it will guide us if the patient is in established preterm labor. So these are the important points we should not miss and they do have an important role to play in diagnosis and planning a management for a preterm birth. Ultrasound is a game changer, I would say, as far as preterm labor is concerned, because when we uh, assess a patient with a good ultrasound, we of course come to know about the cardiac activity, number of babies, pre presentations, estimated fetal weight, status of amniotic fluid, biophysical score. Uh, so all these factors will help us in deciding the further course of management. And this is what is uh, an approach to a patient who is suspected to be in preterm labor. So depending on the gestational age, we will take a call. If the gestational uh, age is more than 34 weeks, literature supports that there should be no tocolysis or antenatal corticosteroids. We should admit the patient. And uh, if the labor progresses, but if the contractions cease, we may think of discharging the patient. Now, if the duration of pregnancy is less than 34 weeks, we need to assess the patient about cervical dilatation. Now, if the cervical dilatation is more than three centimeters, so uh, preterm labor is likely to be there and then we can offer tocolysis. We should give antibiotics for GBS prophylaxis more so in the Western countries, not very commonly practiced in our country. Uh, Dr. Haresh has already talked about max, magnesium sulfate and of course antenatal corticosteroids if the duration of pregnancy is between 23 and 34 weeks. If the clinical examination, the ultrasound examination for cervical length uh, diagnose that the preterm labor is unlikely, we should observe the patient women without progressive cervical dilatation and effacement are discharged at home. We should keep a good follow-up. Of course, the patient has to be counseled that if she experiences any discomfort, pain, unusual discharge, she should come down to the hospital immediately. Preterm labor is unlikely if uh, then the observation needed for four to six hours Women without progressive cervical dilatation and effacements are discharged at home. Call the patient after one or two weeks for a follow-up and she must report if there are any unusual uh, symptoms. 
So we refer to these guidelines and of course there are newer ones and the main class of uh, drugs which are used for management of preterm labor are the tocolytics. Um, when we talk about tocolytics, the beta agonists, isoxuprine and terbutaline are the ones which are most commonly used in our country. Calcium channel blockers like nifedipine is very much there and it is uh, being used for this particular indication for a long time. Magnesium sulfate, Dr. Harish has already talked about. Nitroglycerin, which is a nitric oxide donor, has uh, been noted in some of the studies as a good tocolytic agent. And the oxytocin this receptor antagonist, that is atosibon, is the relatively new kid on the block, which is used for arresting uh, preterm labor. So the question is, which agents should we use? So the most popular agent uh, throughout the world are beta agonists. All agents will produce some kind of uh, effects and side effects. So the clinical effect that we look at is a cessation of uh, labor pains. And some of them will not be useful in some women. But in general, it is found that nifedipine and atosiban are supposed to be safer than the beta agonist. The next question is till when tocolysis should be continued? So we sh should allow the steroids to act. We should allow the intrauterine transfer to a higher center. And then we can consider stopping tocolysis, which typically is around 48 hours. There is little or no benefit from follow-on tocolysis after an episode of preterm contraction has subsided. Atosiban, now it is given in a drip form and this is how it is given. Uh, the IV bolus dose is given where uh, about it's a 6.75 milligram vial, which is given intravenously in an infusion bag uh, over one minute. And then a continuous maintenance drip can be continued for about 48 hours. Nifedipine is the one which is uh, extensively used. And when we start it, we give a stat 20 milligram oral dose. A repeat dose can be given after 30 minutes, another one after 30 minutes, and then eight hourly for 48 to 72 hours. Please note that maximum permissible dose for nifedipine is around 160 milligrams in 24 hours. There are quite a few studies which have researched about nifedipine as tocolytic, and they have concluded that nifedipine is safe and effective in prolonging preterm labor and has minimal maternal and neonatal side effects. It eliminates the need for intensive maternal monitoring as required in cases of beta myometics. We had uh, one study, which in fact, which it was a uh, thesis submitted by one of my students earlier. Where did we continue? Uh, we did continue uh, nifedipine for a longer duration of time. There are a few studies which talk about a maintenance therapy, though not very commonly practiced, but we were able to achieve a prolongation of pregnancy by about two or three weeks, which hopefully was beneficial for the babies. When we talk about safety of currently available tocolytics, we know that beta mimetics should not be used in women who have cardiac arrhythmias, poorly controlled thyroid disease and diabetes mellitus. We must keep a watch on the maternal side effects, which would include a uh, cardiac arrhythmias, pulmonary edema, hyperglycemia, hypotension, etc. And the neonatal card side effects are also there, which have to be, uh, one has to be vigilant when we are using it. Nifedipine is contraindicated in women who have cardiac disease. We must use it with caution in uh, women who have renal impairment. There are certain maternal side effects like headache, dizziness, flushing, etc. Uh, we should be worried about and then uh, literature reports neonatal effects in the form of sudden fetal distress and fetal demise. Uh, Indomethacin, ketorelac, uh, etc. have been used uh, in some cases. They do have significant renal or uh, hepatic impairment, so should be avoided in such women. 
active peptic ulcer disease, coagulation disorders, thrombocytopenia, the, these drugs are better avoided. Coming to isoxoprine, now all of us have used isoxoprine for umpteen numbers of years and it is used in a dilute form. So we usually add it in 500 ml of 5% dextrose or DNS or even lactate. The drip rate has to be uh, as per the contractions. We have to monitor the blood pressure. And here uh, we must remember that it's a potent vasodilator. It's, it has DCG approval. ACOG does recommend beta sympathomimetics as first line therapy in the management of preterm labor. But this is something which we should be vigilant about. And this is the lead uh, one study which was which is from uh, Bijapur in Karnataka, where they did use uh, isoxoprine in about 50 women, and they concluded that isoxoprine was found to be an effective and well-tolerated tocolytic agent in arresting preterm labor, in turn resulting in the overall improvement of maternal and perinatal outcomes. So this was a study published in 2021. Somehow, uh, in spite of its extensive use, we have switched to nifedipine for the last uh, 15 years or so. I'm not going to talk about uh, neuroprotection. We've heard a fantastic lecture by Dr. Haresh Doshi about it. But what we must emphasize on is preventing preterm births. Now, we know that there could be certain risk factors and the cervical screening is something which is a good pointer for uh, prediction of preterm birth. So these are the recommendations of uh, SMFM given in the year 2016, and they recommend a routine transvaginal cervical lens screening for women with singleton pregnancy with history of spontaneous uh, prior pre uh, preterm birth. They also recommend a transvaginal uh, screening not to be performed for women with cervical circulage, multiple gestations, PPROM or placenta previa. They recommend practitioners who decide to implement universal cervical lens screening to follow strict guidelines. And uh, the SMFM recommends sonographers and practitioners receiving specific training in acquisition and interpretation of cervical imaging during pregnancy. Because unless we have a good imaging of the cervix, we are not able to predict and treat preterm labor in time. So progesterone is something which has been extensively studied and used for prevention of preterm births. Now, the recommendations uh, of the SMFM in the year 2012 do hold true even today. So what they recommend is in women who are asymptomatic, but with singleton without spontaneous preterm birth and unknown or normal transvaginal ultrasound cervical length. There is no evidence of efficaciousness, so they do not require any uh, progesterone. Singleton with prior spontaneous preterm births, 17-hydroxyprogesterone seven, uh, caproid 250 milligrams weekly up to 36 weeks of gestation. Singleton without spontaneous preterm birth, but cervical length less than 20 millimeters at 24 weeks. Vaginal progesterone, 90 milligrams gel or 200 milligrams suppository daily from diagnosis of uh, short cervix until 36 weeks of gestation. Multiple gestation is something where uh, researchers have found progesterone has no role uh, in uh, stopping or preventing preterm birth. And in symptomatic women, nothing really works at times, but here we have to be hopeful that whatever in treatment that you're offering does well for the patient. So which progesterone? We do have quite a few options. Uh, the vaginal suppository or vaginal pastry is something which has been extensively studied. It is generally well tolerated. It gives a good <coughs> plasma and tissue concentration and it is also found to be effective. Let's not forget the uh, 17 hydroxy progesterone caprate injections, though there is now uh, some advice against it by the Americans. Uh, in India, we do not have any specific guidance about its uh, use. 
or rather stoppage of use. The oral progesterone generally doesn't work that well, but there are claims that the sustained release preparations do uh, work well as far as arresting preterm labor is concerned. My preference would be to offer a vaginal progesterone or uh, to give uh, intramuscular injections of 17 hydroxyprogesterone caproate weekly. Uh, there are quite a few studies uh, which do talk about uh, progesterone versus circulage versus pastry <coughs> for preventing preterm births in singleton pregnancy. And what they found out was progesterone was the best intervention for preventing preterm birth in singleton pregnancies at risk, reducing preterm births less than 34 weeks and less than 37 weeks, reducing neonatal demise and other sequelae. So it really makes sense to use progesterone in order to prevent preterm birth. So if we can prevent something, why not make a full attempt to do so? The controversial area is multifetal gestation and preterm birth because we are really confused about treatment. If you look at the literature, nothing works in preventing preterm labor as far as uh, multiple gestation is concerned. So 30% of triplet pregnancies will deliver before 26 weeks as compared to 8% of pregnancies where triplets are reduced to twins. So it makes sense to counsel the patient who has conceived with a triplet to think of reduction and with good fetal medicine, especially around uh, the success rates are much better. So the risk of MFRP from twin to singleton uh, are greater than its benefits. Vaginal progesterone for prevention of preterm birth, and this was a uh, randomized trial of safety and epic efficacy published in the year 2016. Administration of vaginal progesterone to reduce uh, symptomatic women, asymptomatic women with a twin gestation and a sonographic short cervix in mid trimester reduces the risk of preterm birth occurring at less than 30 to less than 35 gestational weeks. It also reduces neonatal mortality and some measures of neonatal morbidity without any de demonstrable deleterious effects on childhood neurodevelopment. So this is something which is really important because we are looking at a good outcome without harming the baby. And these are the recommendations of uh, progesterone supplement uh, to prevent preterm births. These are very much available on the net. And these are the ACOG uh, uh, recommendations. Emergency circulage also has a certain role to play. We know that it is a procedure where the cervical dilation, dilatation is very much present. The membranes are many a times exposed to the vagina. It is definitely less effective than prophylactic, but it's a desperate attempt to arrest preterm birth. But let's not forget that there is increased possibility of rupture of membranes during and after the procedures. So we must rule out infections contractions and also rule out rupture of membranes. The addition of tocolytics and prophylactic antibiotics increases the efficiency of the procedure and it definitely has an advantage over the no stitch group. Of course, many of us are putting a womb stitch or even a modified McDonald's stitch as a, an emergency procedure. Steroids are something which are the saviors. So, uh, dexamethasone 12 milligrams, two doses repeated after 12 to uh, 26 hours, or betamethasone 6 milligrams, uh, uh, 12 hourly, four doses. It is indicated in uh, uh, all the patients where we are contemplating preterm birth. Uh, one course or repeat course, there was a time where we used to repeat steroids every week, but that is no more true. So just a single dose, and if it is given be before 28 weeks, we may consider another rescue dose just before uh, thinking of a preterm delivery. It should not be used in women with chorium amniotis, and it has umpteen benefits rather than risks. Uh, in cases of PPROM, we have to be uh, really vigilant because uh, we do have certain tasks to fulfill. Infection prevention is an important aspect. So no repeated PVs, use of judicial antimicrobials is important. Enhanced lung maturity, the 
take a decision whether continuation of pregnancy is safer or not and close monitoring is extremely important which includes hemogram crp to be done every uh, 48 to 72 hours and serial ultrasound and doppler generally uh, repeated every week coming to antibiotic therapy in pprom so here uh, we should uh, look at the benefits uh, which are there with antibiotic use, especially when we are thinking of prolonging pregnancy, and it definitely reduces major neonatal morbidity caused by infections. Which antibiotics typically uh, ampicillin one gram every eight hours for 48 hours followed by erythromycin. Of course, there are studies which talk about azithromycin in the dose of 500 milligrams daily to be continued uh, till the uh, pregnancy is continued. Cephalosporins are, of course, important. Uh, Coamoxiclove is something which is a strict no-no because we are always worried about an increased risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. And decision-making in preterm birth uh, or is something which we have to be weighing because preterm PRO imposes a lot of challenges. So if you decide to wait, it should be for the fetal maturity, the, for the corticosteroids to act or the antibiotics to cover the infection, or if you are thinking of uh, in utero transfer. Well, there are certain reasons that are required to intervene, onset of labor, acute complications, and preventing fetal complications in order to have a better outcome. So it de also depends on the neonatal intensive care unit availability and the parental wishes because if you if you are thinking of in a particular direction, parents may not be on the same line. So their opinion also matters. And here, <clears throat> the fetal well being has to be uh, particularly managed. The gestational period and maternal conditions are extremely important. So when you're delivering the preterm fetus, there are certain points that we must keep in mind. Uh, it, whenever you're performing a C-section, there are challenges. Uh, deciding the route of delivery also is a critical decision. And here, counseling of the patient and the relatives is extremely important. So whenever we are delivering preterm babies, it has to be a balanced decision for intervention. Caesarean section does not necessarily improve the neonatal outcome. So whenever you are contemplating a vaginal delivery for a preterm uh, baby, the care has to be optimum. Electronic monitoring is desirable. Antibiotic cover has to be given. Atraumatic delivery is something which we should aim at and presence of neonatologist is extremely important. And performing the C-section is extremely difficult because here we have to remember that the lower segment is generally uh, un unformed or poorly formed. There are extensions possible. Bleeding is generally more. And these are poor surgical risk candidates. And one has to be really careful with a presence of senior obstetrician. What are the indications for a cesarean delivery in preterm del births? Abnormal presentation, breach, transverse lie, etc. C-section is prudent. Acute complications before or after onset of labor, C-section has to be a low threshold decision. And failure to progress where you are attempting a vaginal uh, delivery. And if it doesn't happen, uh, one has to resort to C-section. And these are some of the important points that we uh, should remember whenever we are thinking of uh, uh, c-section in premature babies this is one app i have personally not used it but i have read about it which uh, talks about the evaluation of impact of triaging women who are at risk of spontaneous preterm births it incorporates a predictive model with women with history of spontaneous preterm birth gestational age and quantitative measurement of fetal fibronectin it gives us accurate assessment of risk of threshold of preterm birth, avoiding unnecessary admissions. And we are able to manage these patients on an OPD basis. So to conclude, preterm birth is a preventable problem and we have to go all out to achieve it. Vigilant monitoring and aggressive treatment is essential. Progesterone 
especially the natural micronized progesterone and 17 hydroxy uh, progesterone caproid have important role to play in prevention of preterm births and should be offered to women where we are contemplating a preterm birth based on history. So we would prefer to start it at around 16 weeks in order to prevent it. Tocolytics have an important role to play in acute preterm labor where we want uh, to stop the contractions. Steroid administration is a vital aspect of preterm birth and management and cervical circulage has its own role to play in preventing preterm birth or treating preterm birth as, as a, an emergency procedure and should be used judiciously. So thank you very much. And once again, thank you, uh, Pratik, for giving me an opportunity to talk about preterm labor. Uh, Dr. Parag, that was a absolutely complete presentation. Uh, I was, you know, trying to find some loophole, you know, that... <laughs> I could point out, but there was none. So you have actually spoken everything. And I think actually uh, we get very good results with isoxyprene because we were using it uh, in our initial days. And now also I am seeing very good results still with it. And progesterone is our lifeline. So um, and if a patient comes at 36 weeks, would you like to give steroid? Uh, that is a controversial uh area but i would still give it uh, if you, yeah, if you refer it. to the yeah if you refer to the rcog guidelines what they say is if you are uh, probably some internet issues. yeah but even the rcog guidelines recommend that at 37 weeks if you are doing an elective cesarean section even then, in that case, you do give a steroid antibiotic. Yeah, before they are saying it. actually, now it is said that before 39 weeks, uh, whenever the patient is delivering, you should give. Because yeah, actually, there is no harm in giving, I feel. Absolutely. And it only benefits of, and it saves so many NICU admissions. The incidence of transient tachypnea of newborn yes, is significantly right. lower. And even at 37 weeks, the incidence of PTN can be 1 to 2 percent. And as Dr. Anjana rightly pointed out, NICU admission will significantly yeah, increase. Yeah, significantly reduced. So the pediatricians are like, oh, acha, you gave the steroid coverage. So, so fine, the baby is fine. There was an electricity failure. So suddenly, you know, okay. I went to top line. Yeah. Uh, see, RCOG talks about giving steroid before uh, if, if you are doing an elective C-section before 39 weeks of pregnancy. Yeah, 39 weeks. So I personally weeks, feel that we yeah. should give it. it. It doesn't cause uh, any harm. And I, I give know, it to prevent uh, NICU admissions. Uh, NICU admission and then, you know, even transient acupnea of newborn is taken care of. So, I mean, we it would we give it routinely even if it is 35 yeah. or 36 weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I feel sometimes there is a slight error in the gestational age estimation also. So uh, this covers it. Now, if we have given steroids, so the baby is uh, does not suffer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we should not, you know, it is such a simple intervention without uh, any harm. We should offer its benefit uh, to our uh, patients. Yeah. Because the... Because, you know, the NICU admission, the morbidity associated with it, even the financial morbidity oh, yes. that is associated with NICU. Nikus is, are very uh, really expensive important. nowadays. Nikus yes. are most expensive. So it is. Achha, another thing I wanted to say was that uh, nifedipine causes very uh, horrible headaches as side effects. So uh, I don't give it to my patient. So we, we, we've switched over to nifedipine about 15 years ago, though for acute preterm labor. Uh, isoxuprine is still, uh, it works wonderfully well. I would certainly like uh, Dr. Harish also to give his opinions regarding this. Uh, but then, you know, you have to counsel the patient that nifedipine is likely to produce uh, headaches. And typically, uh, if you uh, notice it, it is very much there in 46, 48 to 6, 72 hours. And generally then it subsides or possibly the patient gets used to it. So she doesn't. No, you can't headache. get used to those severe throbbing headaches. 
<laughs> in any case, I think we have to remember that nitroglycerin being used in preterm labor, which is endorsed by the RCOG guidelines. It's an off-label use of nitroglycerin. That's not the way the original manufacturer intended yeah. its usage. India Mainly traditionally for has been isoxuprine, isoxuprine country. And yeah. I think we are all very comfortable yeah, with Yeah, we are very we comfortable with the isoxuprine. those drips in our younger days. Yes. And we would add on our... And right. we'll pass we it on to our juniors as well. We should Dr. accept Harish, this how and many, Dr. Haresh, how many ampules of Duadlon you put in that? Madam, no four. trade name. Four. 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 Not four. ten ampules. Four. four ampules. Four, four. Okay. We usually start with, I mean, for acute preterm labor, we usually start with uh, 40 milligrams and then, you know, try and uh, reduce it. Yes, correct. Yeah, but then you know, even even today we don't give it beyond uh, forty eight hours. I mean, no. Yes. Normally the pains do subside, or she delivers either way. So that brings us to the Q and A session, and there are only two or three questions which are relevant. Most of them have already been addressed by our two very excellent speakers. The first question is from Dr. Ila Agarwal from Mathura, and I think this is for Dr. Arish Joshi sir. Does the risk of Atonic PPH increase if you administer medication. That's what she's asking. No, with this dose, right, there is no risk of atonic PPH. <laughs> We've been using it for eclampsia, 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 as well as the topolytic effect itself. So, no risk of atonic PPH, right, has been found also in studies also that uh, this is not increased. It's a theoretical. I'm just sharing my screen because I want to show one very important slide because there is a relevant question. And the question is, what strength, 25%, 20%, 50%, and what should be the dilution of magnesium sulfate, which should be used? So the short answer is, there is now a ready-made solution which is available. That's 4 yeah. grams in 100 ml. The trade name, I'm not supposed to take during a program, but since they are our education partners for this particular event, I will tell you, it's called IV Mag. It's very easy to administer. You just set this up with an infusion pump and you can give this slowly as a bolus over 15 to 20 minutes. And the next pint of 100 ml, you give at the rate of 25 ml per hour for the next four hours. As Dr. Arish Doshi said, that it takes only four hours for neuroprotection. So you will need only two small 100 ml pints. It's a totally no-brainer situation. You don't need to worry about 20%, 25%, 50%, 50%. All you need to do is adjust the drip rate if you don't have an infusion pump. If you have an infusion pump, then that will do your job completely for you. It's the first pint of 100 ml to be given over 15 to 20 minutes in repeating. The second pint of 100 ml at the rate of 25 ml per hour for the next four hours. So that's it. Short, sweet and simple. It's an absolute no brainer Even in periphery, in a primary health center, when there are paramedical staff, there are no doctors around, or the doctor is on leave, there's only one clinician attached to that primary health center. This is going to be a boon and is going to help, not only in cases of preterm labor, but obviously in cases of epilepsy as well. Also, there is yes. no proper hospital to take care of that patient. And that first dose of Maxell is the one which is going to save the patient's life. Yes. There is one question from Dr. Mithun Sarkar, and I think this has already been addressed, the rule of magnesium sulfate in the protection, which we have already talked about. And Dr. Monica Agarwal has just put in a message, she's from Mumbai. In GDM patients, we usually deliver at 38 weeks, should we give steroids and it may be in the sugar. I think this is in response to the discussion that we just had at the few minutes back. Even in GDM, whenever we are thinking of preterm birth, it is prudent to give uh, um, steroids. Yes. Monitor sugars closely. You know, if she is GDM on medications, then ideally she should be admitted and then observed for next 48 hours with closed sugar monitoring. And the insulin doses need to be adjusted depending on the sugar. Correct. It requires to be increased by four units uh, average. The patient is already on insulin. We have done this, but we yeah. always give. We always give. Yeah, and if the patient is controlled on diet, then generally nothing is required. Nothing. Is. You just have to. Yeah, you just have to counsel the patient for after that after administering steroids, 
she may perceive less fetal movements for next 24 to 48 hours because this is the general observation which we come to know from the patients themselves so and this is something which we have to and even if it increases little sugar in our branch we always weigh the benefits with the risk the benefits yes. of steroids is too much so risk little increase in sugar no problem the end of the Q&A session, I would request all our eminent faculty to give any closing remarks. I was trying to get in touch with Dr. Nathani Maid, madam. I think she is in call to an emergency. I still see her logged in. Yes, madam, we were just talking about it. We would welcome some closing remarks from you, madam, there at the end of our session. Hello, Dr. Pratik. Yes, <laughs> So, Parag, excellent lecture. I was busy with some other <laughs> webinar also, but I could hear. And thank you very much for inviting us for this wonderful program. <laughs> and wish me good luck. All my ICOG. <laughs> oh, Everyone is ICOG here. Cool. All ICOG the best. All the best. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonders in the foxy once elected. <laughs> Any other uh, yeah, remarks? I was telling Dr. Meg that she did a lot for the governing council members when she was the chairperson. No, I was telling them that you should keep on uh, that, you know, award. Uh, Parag and me have instituted that award. That gives a lot of motivation for the governing council to work because they compile their work. They keep on doing good work and that is an involvement. And everybody, we have awesome. Kumar till today shows that uh, trophy of first, uh, you know, first award she received. Then Arjuna Basir third award, Sarita Valera second award. It is such a, you know, prestigious thing to have that award. And you people are already doing so much. I think I told Lakshmi this year you must institute that again start the award which I have started. Yes, ma'am. Okay, then. If, if, if she doesn't, I will again restart when I wake up chairman. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 will definitely do because everything is was done me as a chair and he as a Parag. Parag there, is... there was another thing that you had to do, Parag, which you promised that you will do when you become the chair. <laughs> what is that? What is that? <laughs> Even I told him that why doesn't I so I mean if I am doing a program for ISOPAP. Why can't I get uh, uh, ICOG points? No, no, listen, uh, listen, ma'am, first. So, uh, because uh, basically ISOPAB also has Foxy members only. So, uh, but uh, he said, no, this is not the norm. But when I become the chair, then, then I'll get it done. So, that is why I'm reminding him. <laughs> and, anyway, and anyway, I love to log on with other societies of Foxy. Anyway, so, it's fine. Uh, for any policy to make, you have to look from many angles. There is a ISR, there is IEG, there is everything. They just want to put the logo and yeah, not, yeah. not give any respect so I think to the ICOG. So I we think will uh, turn this political discussion for now while I present the vote of thanks <laughs> because we are still live and we are on air. Yeah, okay. yeah one good. thing I would <laughs> like to say in the end is that... Yes, uh, prematurity and preterm birth is always a cause of concern. And one thing that uh, we have to be very careful about is uh, the gestational age. And for that, the first ultrasound is the one which is of utmost importance. So uh, at least I am relying most on the first ultrasound. And then according to that, you calculate the date because often it is very confusing whether we are going to, uh, whether the baby that's coming out is going to be absolutely preterm or the child is going to be uh, FTND, I mean normal delivery, uh, it should be pre, uh, fully normal and uh, a term baby rather. So uh, this we have to be very careful in judging what is uh, preterm and what is not preterm. And of course, neuroprotection is very important that Dr. Doshi has already told us and everything else Parag has told us. So thank you, Dr. Anjana Khanna, for that important point of dating ultrasound, especially the interior of the patient don't register until the seventh month and there's no ultrasound. It's yes. very important to have the dating scan in the first trimester. So I'll close today's event as the convener. By presenting the common views of thanks. This is Dr. Pratik I'd like to place on record my gratitude to the amount of office bearers, 
our beloved president, Dr. Adam Yuki Information, Secretary Dr. Sudhakar Rajan. Thank you for your blessings and for allowing us to conduct this experience series. Today's program was on freedom, labor, and specifically protecting the activist speakers. We had two eminent stalwarts, Dr. Harish Doshi, sir, as the first speaker, who spoke on the role of Hindu protection. And we had Dr. Paragvini Wale, sir, uh, vice chair of ICOG, who spoke on treatment of freedom labor in general, an exhaustive presentation covering the history geography at length and breadth of freedom labor. Two fantastic stalwarts, Dr. Manati Munek, the past chair of ICOG, and our candidate for proxy president, thank you for raising the occasion. She was also incidentally my responsible for the interim charge for the report for the report. And Dr. Anjana Khanna, our past vice president of proxy, current government council member of ICUG. Also, I must acknowledge the ICUG office bearers, Dr. Lakshmi Shikhande, the chairperson of ICUG, Dr. Ashok Kubar, the secretary of ICUG. Thank you for the ICUG credit point for today's event and all other events in the city. Our scientific backbone, Science Integra, Sudhu and Shutika, who is newly joined. Thank you for being here with us for this program. And last but not least, our education partners, listen, makers of I3, Carbison, and IEMAC. Thank you for being our education partners throughout this year for bringing these valuable programs to our audience. We have an audience of nearly 700 who have logged in live despite it being a scorching hot afternoon in India. It's 45 degrees in Bombay. Thank you very much for logging in and we hope to see you in the next event. Until next time, goodbye, God bless. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. One small thing. Yes, the report uh, of your activities. I have to Yes, ma'am. I will send you. I will send you as soon as it's compiled. You can take us off there, please. Thank you.